What I want to talk about today is, in fact, how our own game of knowledge sharing, knowledge capture may have changed. It may be changing having to do with this exponential world we're in, believing that perhaps we're going to need new lenses to make a lot of sense out of this. But if we go back to our post-past context, where, in fact, um, the holy grail of almost all of our corporations had to do with the, you might call it scalable efficiency. Um, I call it the push economy, um, where basically in order to get the scale, we wanted everything to be very predictable. Um, we wanted organizations to be hierarchical, controllable, we managed organizational routines, um, and of course, minimized variance. Um, and that was the story throughout a good share of the 20th century and possibly even the first five years or so in the 21st century. Um, and around that stability, um, we built basically everything we know in organizational theory. Our management practices, our strategies, our corporate training, and how we even thought about knowledge sharing um, in a relatively stable world. And then the big shift happened. Um, the big shift that we moved from a logistics curve that said there were brief moments of some substantial innovation and then long periods of stability following, for example, electrification and so on and so forth. Those periods of stability is when we reinvented our practices, um, how we ran things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in today's world, often we call it the exponential world, um, we have a new set of challenges. In fact, I think more realistically, what we really have today is an exponential curve where almost every 18 months, something new is happening that we have to think about. So we have 18 month punctuated evolutions, bang, 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 um, challenging the stability of the practices we may have had before. In fact, I think it's fair to say, and this is quite controversial, but I think it's fair to say that yesterday's best practices are almost all becoming rapidly outmoded. In fact, even our ways of knowing may be coming outdated. But what does this all mean? What it really all means is there is a big shift moving from looking at stocks of knowledge, often gathered in authoritative ways, et cetera, et cetera, um, into thinking about living in a world of flow. And basically this flow is knowledge flow. And the game today is more how do you participate in knowledge flows, given these 18-month exponential jumps. Um, and here is the dirty catch. In this kind of period of constant little jumps, almost everything we do is actually creating new knowledge, most of it tacit. We have not had time to distill out the stable formal part from the muscle knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, Piani made so famous calling a tacit knowledge, or the Nakasan. Um, and so we have to think about what this participation in this kind of world of constantly creating tacit knowledge. Um, and then how do we really get scalable learning? The reason why this is not just an academic question is because I think we've moved into a world in which, in fact, the half-life of a given skill today most of our skills today, has been reduced to about five years. Um, that means all of us are going to be constantly picking up new skills all the time. Um, how do we really do that? I like to think of kind of a way to view this is when I first grew up, my father said to me, John, think of yourself as a steamboat. You set a course and you grit it through. No matter what is there, you plow ahead. You know, I said, Dad, I don't know about you, but I believe, let's play with the winds. Let's play with the naturally occurring forces. Let's think of ourselves as sailboats. Um, and how do you work with the winds, not against them? And yes, 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 sometimes you get blown really off course. And what do you do? You do a hard tack. Um, then, by the way, as I entered this new world, I'm going to call it the networked age. I think of it as more like whitewater kayaking that I'll show you in a moment. Um, I came to Silicon Valley and I realized this hard tack is, of course, called pivot. 
So how do you pivot all the time? Um, and so I think we do have a strange new world that we have to think about. There's a little sign of whitewater kayaking, increasingly fast, radically contingent, and hyper-connected world. So everything we do ripples across the whole world, as all of us in this town clearly know by now. <laughs> um, and yes, you learn how to roll, um, and so on and so forth. And in fact, it's interesting that if you take whitewater kayaking seriously, um, one of the things you have to become is deeply kind of authentic in what your own body can do. Because when you roll, is not the time to start thinking. <laughs> it really ain't. <laughs> and so, in a curious sort of way, handling these roles require you really having to do knowing where your center of gravity really is and who the hell you really are. Um, but perhaps more importantly, we're entering a world where it's no longer just thinking about deepening our individual expertise within our own specialized silos, but to take more seriously, each of us in this room is constantly embedded in multiple tribes. We have knowledge flowing all over in all kinds of different ways. Um, and that's the sense of almost a whitewater world just there. How do you keep track of these things? How do you know what to pay attention to, what to believe, so on and so forth? Um, in the various networks we're all a part of. We are embedded and everything is in flux. Um, but think about this now, going back to the original slide. Um, how does tacit knowledge flow in these types of networks? Um, and I think one of the ways we begin to understand is one of the interesting ways to capture a lot of tacit knowledge is how do we, for example, snap videos and then go back and reflect on those videos after the fact? Um, how do we use social media in new ways? Um, how do we take seriously augmented reality and more particularly, from my point of view, mixed reality and virtual reality where you can, at a distance, participate in something and so the catch is, how do you participate in a sense that it almost touches you emotionally as well as just cognitively? And in fact, one of the interesting new gadgets on the horizon is the HoloLens. It's a beautiful mixed reality tool, which I can now zoom in um, and project one world on top of another world in order to augment my own understanding of how to repair this device and so on and so forth. Um, these devices are changing an awful lot of how we work with complex equipment, repair equipment, and so on and so forth. But you know, yeah, these are cool tools, but we now need to take more seriously escaping our own competency traps, the competency traps of our own organization, and now we have to do it even faster than ever before. Now I can speak personally coming from Xerox, next door to Kodak, et cetera. <laughs> what happens when you don't escape your own competency traps? Um, let's look at what a competency trap really is. Um, it really is the case that you get locked into building something, you become increasingly competent around that. All your beliefs, your skills are built up around that. And it really does impede your ability to see new patterns. I call this to our attention because part of the game we have in this room is how do we sense those new patterns? How do we communicate those new patterns? I will guarantee you initially there will be massive denial. So we may have to find new ways to capture those patterns. By the way, mixed reality may be a tiny step in that direction. But how do these kind of competency traps really do block seeing new patterns? I just want to take us through one little example uh, we can map it into today's world if you want, but it has to do with the competency trap around the clipper ships. In the 1880s, the clipper ship industry, much like Kodak, was under attack. <laughs> um, and the people that owned the clipper ships laughed at the steamboats and said, oh, give me a break. Um, we, can, we can outperform them. Um, and the Gravelin was created in the 1880s um, in order to show the definitive thing that you could do with a clipper ship. It was awesome, carried huge tonnage, it moved fast, and so on and so forth. 
But guess what? That didn't last very long, but don't worry. The Francis II came along, more sail area, more tonnage, faster, so on and so forth. It thought it put the nail in the steamships, but lo and behold, nope. A couple years later, the Prusen came along. Now, this is an awesome machine, an awful lot of sail area. Um, and this is, you know, these are real pictures. These are historically right. Um, and that didn't last very long. So finally, to put this whole story to bed, <laughs> the Thomas W. Lawson was created. Massive amounts of sail area. Actually, this had the first steel hull and a clipper ship and so on and so forth. The sad story is on its maiden voyage, ironically, Friday, December 13th, 1907, this took off on its maiden voyage. Um, and within a few hours, hit the rocks, um, was blown into them, and sank. Um, strangely, sadly, everyone died except the CEO, pardon me, the captain. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, it's a story that's so great you can't forget it. Uh, I couldn't help but think about that when I look at many of our corporations today. Um, yes, competency traps reign supreme. Um, and this, by the way, holds for all of us here. It also holds for our corporations. It also holds for our universities. And by the way, it also holds for our governments. Um, so we live in this world. Um, and part of our job is how do we capture the patterns and get them communicated in a way that actually begins to change behavior. Um, indeed, for this, we need something more than just scalable learning, which most of us specialize in. We need something weird. We need to think about unlearning, scalable unlearning. Welcome to the whitewater world of exponentials. The things we learned five or 10 years ago may be fundamentally misleading us today. Um, how do we break free of those? Yes, scalable unlearning. That is a willingness to unlearn old habits and old beliefs. This is tricky. This is very tricky. Unlearning habits and beliefs is hard. It's hard in part because tacit knowledge can be surprisingly hard to recognize and it can foster fundamentally incorrect beliefs and, needless to say, denial. And my guess is many of us work in situations right now where our management is in a state of denial uh, in terms of what we do. So in order to kind of see how hard it is to begin to understand how tacit knowledge itself is deeply held and incredibly hard for ourselves to even see the tacit beliefs that we have, I have a test. Okay, now most of us here have probably ridden bicycles. Um, and I want you to consider the following test. And ordinarily, if I had planned this ahead, I would have gotten a bicycle in here for us, although this room is a bit tricky to uh, ride a bicycle in. Um, the, um, I want you to consider the fact that I'm riding this bike and I'm gonna have two ribbons, on, one on each handle. And the beauty of a ribbon is you can only pull it. You can't push a ribbon or a string, okay? And so here I am, I'm riding this bike along with my two ribbons holding. If I'm riding real handed, there's no problem, of course, but I'm still holding the ribbons. And now here is the question. I wanna turn left. Which ribbon do I pull? Duh. Please. Left, right, right. I mean, come on, people. Left. Uh, are, are, are we awake here? Okay. Uh, I'm being a little bit melodramatic here, but the fact is, no. Each one of us would pull, does pull, has to pull the right ribbon. This is a tacit belief we have. Um, that we don't even know we have. We know how to ride a bicycle. And we know to turn left, you actually pull the right. Um, and yet, it's almost impossible for us to kind of get at that knowledge that we have. Um, one thing is, 
You might try it, but I guarantee you, I suggest trying it in a safe place. When I looked at the width here, I knew that there's not enough width here to actually have you try this, because you will probably crack up. Um, but uh, here is one existential thing you can think about, and then I'll show you more scientifically what's going on here. But if you're a kid um, living in a town that has curbs, California, not all of the cities have towns have curbs. Um, and have you ever kind of been on a bike when the game was to see how close you could ride to the curb? Many of us have. Um, and if you have, you experience something very strange. As you got arbitrarily close to the curb, usually between five to six inches, not that you would have ever thought about measuring that, believe me, but, but um, suddenly the curb seems to have a magnetic, magnetic force that just pulls you into the curb and you crack up. Um, the catch is, what's really going on here is a bicycle, as is a motorcycle, is a gyroscope. And what really happens is when you turn on a gyroscope, you've got to knock it off its axis. So when I'm riding my bike and close to this curb, I actually pull it into the curb and I hope I have enough room to throw the gyroscope over so that the gyroscope is what pulls me around. That is how we ride bicycles. Um, if you're a high-performance motorcyclist, um, you learn very quick. If you have to do a fast swerve uh, to the left, you push with all your force against the left. Um, the, um, or vice versa, going the other way. Um, so we're actually riding gyroscopes. Um, it's never been taught to us, never been told. Um, but that is kind of a simple example of the tacit beliefs that we hold, that we don't know we hold. Um, now I want to say that many of the things we do in today's world are just like that. Yes, they're equivalent forms of gyroscopes um, that cause you to do things that are kind of counterintuitive. Um, but the fact is, we do not have direct access to many of the tacit beliefs that we actually do hold. That's one of the reasons why unlearning is so damn hard. So what should we do about it? I first want to tell you three quick stories and then take it into the institutional structure. I'm going to say, let's first think about how do you do something on the edge. Um, Jack Hittery, fairly successful hedge fund trader uh, in New York, um, actually has a protocol for challenging his own understanding. Once a year, he explicitly takes off three or four or five days to get out of his own comfort zone and to challenge the hell out of what he believes. And he has a protocol. If you know Jack, that's not too surprising. He has a protocol for doing this. Here is his protocol. This is actually how I met Jack. I was at Aspen at an energy conference, and he decided this summer he wanted to master how energy, the, the, the economy underlying energy production and distribution. So we have a workshop at Aspen on this, um, the Aspen Institute. Um, and he goes and he says, here's what I do, John. The first day, just like here, I sit all the talks. I listen intently, I take careful notes, and so on and so forth. Hey, well, duh, Jock. That's shocking, isn't it? No, it's not, it's not shocking. <laughs> That's obvious what you do, OK? Um, but the second day, here's what I do. I never go to a talk. I sit outside by the coffee pots. Why do I sit outside by the coffee pots? Because I'm listening intently to how people talk with each other in that field, in the community of practice around that particular subject. Because we talk funny, each of us, in our own disciplinary silos. And the catch is to listen how those conversations are structured, how they go, and so on and so forth. And then the third day, I dive in and actually enter the conversations. Yes, I put myself at risk looking like a stupid fool, but that's what I do. Uh, and so, A, get the content, B, get the genre of interaction, and C, try it out. Um, 
putting yourself at risk. That's his protocol. He does it every year. By the way, Jack came back from this gathering. This was a few years ago. And what did he do? He learned so much of those three days. He got back to New York. He lives in New York City. He went to Emil Bloomberg. Um, and he's the one that convinced uh, Michael to actually create the um, uh, hybrid taxi process and, and, and ruling in New York City. And then six months later, he came down here. He met with Obama and talked Obama into the cash for clunkers car uh, program. Um, and so it's very interesting that that's how fast he moved, um, having then picked up so much, he felt confident to be able to do that. What I'm really saying is, how do we think about ways that we structure serendipity, which is, can be a lot more than just luck? How do you choose the environments? How do you develop practices to probe those? And then how do you enhance what you actually discover? Um, I could spend the entire talk on this, and some of you have heard me describe um, a whole group of um, world-class surfers and how they have developed a set of practices around doing this. I won't take you down that path now. Um, but I just want to kind of call that to your attention. And in fact, I just came from something called Food Camp that Tim O'Reilly ran uh, two years ago in San Francisco. And I was stunned. Isn't that, we had 150 folks there. Uh, almost every conceivable discipline you can believe, from sociology, history, to obviously the Geekville, being Silicon Valley, uh, to um, economics, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was very interesting because all the rooms were these small breakout rooms. And it was very interesting for me to experience another version of this, where we would sit in a room, uh, often with 12 to 15 people, everyone from a different field and then learn how to listen with and to each other. Um, it turned out for me to be one of the best conferences I've ever gone to in my life. Uh, um, there's something about that. Um, I'll come back to the, something about how do you then listen this way. But um, I want to consider one other kind of example of this um, in this exponential world. I think we have to go back and rethink Obviously, mentoring, we all talk about that in the corporate world, and da, da, da. But what about reverse mentoring? Um, in particular, a simple little example um, of reverse <laughs> mentoring. No, Grandma, listen. Double click the Chrome icon. <laughs> we all go through this, OK? Uh, there's something about now, how do you actually take seriously learning from the edge? Um, priceless ability to learn new things that challenge our beliefs um, if we're willing to listen uh, and listen with humility. For me, I got into this some time ago because some of you know that I do a lot of work in massively multiplayer games, World of Warcraft in particular. Um, and in 2002, I was in New York um, doing a, a big keynote on a panel with, uh, heavens Betsy, the, the New York Times critic, uh, J.C. Hertz. Um, and we had this great panel, it was great, it was very successful. And JC walks up to me afterwards, and he says, John, your talk was so great. I said, oh, thank you, JC, thank you. She uh, said, but you know, John, I knew you didn't know a damn thing you were talking about. <laughs> so, oh, you know, I, she said, like, but if you really care, I suggest this. Come, let me mentor you. Fly to New York for a year. Work with me. Um, do everything I ask you to do. And by the end of that year, I will have you able to successfully talk to every major game designer in the world today. Uh, and I said, JC, game on. This is, I just stepped down from being chief scientist of Xerox Corporation, and I said, ah, now that's what got me this notion of chief of confusion. I said, I want to enter the state of being totally confused uh, and into this gaming world, which is doubly confusing, I might add, uh, massively only play games, that is, um, and to really spend a year marinating with the designers, learning a whole new way to see the world, and so on and so forth. Okay, stories are great, John. Um, but we need a more systematic way to approach this. Um, how do we kind of 
approach these challenges we really confronting from an organizational, a more systematic point of view. Um, in some of that, we have to consider institutional innovations. Much of what we have to do here today is how do we get our institutions to do different things, not just use different tools. Um, tools are helpful. I'll come back to them continuously. But how may we think about organizing differently or how might we function differently? Let me take you through some quick examples. Hack a month. Hack a month is an idea that Facebook has implemented. Hack a month says, if you've been in Facebook for a year, we want you to take a month off and join other people who have been here a year um, and join that group. And we have a set of problems that you can propose a problem. And we want to hack a thong, but unlike a half a thong, this lasts an entire month. We want you to come together in groups of like 10 or 12 people. And we want you to pick a problem or choose a problem. Um, and we want you to do your damnedest to crack that problem in this month. Um, what happens is an awful lot of new stuff really does come out of this, but that's secondary. The primary reason is how do you bust the silos that you come from? How do you penetrate those silos? How do you build a working relationship, a new kind of a practice, which is tacitly constructed to a large extent with other people around all Facebook, such that if you go back to your old home, you now have a deep connection with these other people. Um, it's a little bit like actually how Silicon Valley does work. But just think about that. And I was intrigued that they actually implement, and they still implement uh, this process in order to break down silos. Um, another example in New York, Scatton, um, which is, in my book, the most conservative law firm in New York City, um, which I never would have expected anything like this from. Um, they were kind of recruiting, as they do massive recruit programs. Um, and when they were discovering a few years ago that the kids that would be coming in this year, um, the new recruits, um, formed their own cohort, of course, because they all came out of law schools together, different law schools, but together. Um, Lo and behold, the CFO noticed something strange. This cohort was getting everything done in about one third the time. Strange. Now, to a CFO, that was not good. It was one third the billing. <laughs> Duh. Anyway, I uh, won't go down that path here. <laughs> um, but what they decided to do is to try to figure out what is going on. So they called the CTO in and said, investigate. And the CTO did. And what he found out was that these kids, I am calling them kids, um, had formed their own internal Twitter, in essence, within a safe firewall, Twitter network. And any time any one of them got an unusual situation, they would tweet to each other, um, hey, didn't we learn something about this two years ago in law school case dot, dot, dot? And invariably, within one minute, one of their cohort would reply. Um, this was very interesting. Um, so the decision was that uh, Peter, who was the CTO, said, why don't we do this? We have a lot to learn from these kids. But these kids could be fantastic mentors to our most senior partners. But let me tell you, if you take these kids and put them in a room as senior partners, it's a strange conversation. <laughs> so Peter said, OK, I will become the uh, interlocutor. I will moderate these meetings. And so once every few weeks, perhaps down to a month now, um, Peter would call in the cohort, the youngsters, with the most senior partners and have an hour conversation where, in fact, the senior partners could learn a lot from the kids, but simultaneously the kids could learn a lot from the senior partners. A whole new dynamic of knowledge sharing was created, much of it having to do with tacit structure as well as explicit structure. Kind of the third example um, is more personal. <clears throat> it has to do with how do we really think about doing radical innovation. I would say the 20th century, which Xerox PARC and Bell Labs were prime examples of, um, 
what we would do is we would create these things on the side, on the edge, uh, Park, Xerox Park at the time, Bell Labs on the other hand. Um, and we, of course, geniuses, would be inventing fantastically cool stuff. Um, and then what we would do is we would struggle to push it into this core of the corporation, and the core of the corporation, with, with great brilliance, gobble it up and destroy it through their own corporate immune system. Um, very seldom did anything really get through those walls that resisted that type of uh, kind of attack. Um, totally, by the way, understandable if you think about all the, again, psychodynamics of how these things work. Um, the 21st century may be closer to Amazon today that says, well, maybe what we want to do is have more and more of the corporation just be two pizza team, um, kind of agile teams um, that attack real problems with awesome tools where they do have end-to-end -end responsibility of creating but also taking it to the marketplace. Um, and so creating massive numbers of these experiments um, that go all the way, okay? Now, here's the catch. In the 20th century, that was a, a ridiculous idea because you had no way to reach the market in any community way. You would nev never be able to um, acquire the right kind of capitalization, to acquire the right kind of tools to be able to build this stuff, dot, dot, dot. Um, in today's world, game change, game different. Today's world, we have cloud computing. With my credit card now, I can command an astronomical amount of computation to do a particular problem. Um, I don't have to have any capital acquisition costs at all. Yes, I got an op cost, but relatively small. Um, so basically, you can do this stuff without any massive delays in getting approvals. Um, it also is a case um, that using the cloud enables you to take an idea that catches on and scale it instantly without having to spend half a year building out your, your center. But it also lets you leverage social media in terms of reaching the market directly, the big data, Let's us find weak signals and interpret them. And of course, if you want to go to the extreme, which a couple of us do, how do you use blockchain today to be able to build something that doesn't have any kind of administrative overhead to it if you're selling something? Um, in my case, how do you build smart contracts in blockchain? So these are the tools that now enable two pizza teams. By a two pizza team, I mean a team that's no bigger than needs to be fed by two pizzas, which is about 10 to 12 people. Uh, to be able to do things. Um, and so suddenly you find a place like Amazon that may have 1,000, 2,000 of these um, teams to actually constantly be pushing, but engaging in the market, not just thinking about it. Um, but we also need tools to help us listen and hear each other, especially in this fast paced, even with agile teams, because all the Agile teams that I'm a part of comprise diverse talents. And how to think about the diverse talents and how to communicate across that, let me tell you, is non-trivial. So we gotta look at unlearning our own bad habits, so to speak. I wanna call attention to Sandy Petlin at MIT Social Physics that says, you know, we need a theory of how people make decisions as functions of their interaction. Once you realize their patterns, if you can predict those patterns, you can do some interesting things. In fact, he has something called reality mining. What makes great teams? Um, just by looking at some of the sociometric data, you can actually see how that team is beginning to function, um, how they really communicate with each other, and how they explore together. In fact, a beautiful paper came out in the Harvard Business Review a little while ago, how do you build great teams. What's interesting is what they discovered, and they run some pretty nice experiments, so this is the Sloan Management School, is by just listening to the kinds of interactions within a business team at Sloan in terms of their master projects at the end of the year. Um, not ever, ever even looking at the business proposals that they created. Just listening to the intonation, not the words, the intonation, of how they were talking, how much shared conversation there was in the group, 
how much overtalk there was in the group, so on and so forth. They could predict with shocking accuracy who would win the business competition, with never even looking at the business proposal. This was a counterintuitive result. Um, the data is surprisingly robust on this. How do they collect this kind of data? Well, this is getting a little bit draconian. Um, in those days, we wore badges. Um, and those badges kind of didn't record what we were saying, but recorded when we were saying something, what the intonational structure was, what the prosodies were, the kind of meta structures of the conversation, not the words. And from that, we could actually find the patterns of what was going on. And from those patterns, make these types of predictions. Now, this, of course, is an experiment, repeated, but um, it's a little bit hard to see us all walking around with these types of badges uh, in the corporate world today, although it's getting something damn close to it with our cell phones. But um, I want to suggest, uh, and this is kind of work in progress. I'm a part of this group. Um, we're now beginning to look at DevOps, where you now have end-to-end -end responsibility for creating a service. Uh, and lo and behold, we're finding all the tools that we use to facilitate making things happen in this agile world. Each one is easy to tap. Each one now has APIs. From those APIs, it's very easy to collect almost digital dust um, of things that are left behind. Looking at the patterns of that, we can begin to look at at least the types of patterns we were just talking about, and we believe we can look at much more. Hard to tell that's going to work out. Um, the real question is, with that kind of data, how do we expose it to the team members themselves to get them to reflect on it in practice, to see how they could actually become more functional, et cetera, et cetera. Some very interesting tasks lay ahead, and how do we use that kind of data, not just as a management tool from the top, but rather the team itself does it. And again, coming from the world of Warcraft, let me tell you, um, we operate these things in high-end raid teams and guilds. Um, each of us has our own dashboards. At the end of a, of a raid, um, we basically would do a reflection, reflective in practice of what actually happened. We take our dashboards, we look at what each one was measuring about each other and ourselves, and from that, we actually tune up the kind of dashboards we've created. Notice that today, in the corporate world, dashboards are created by management, if they're created at all. In World of Warcraft, it counts on intrinsic motivation only, not extrinsic. There's a lot of motivation to create dashboards that measure your own performance. Again, tapping practices that you have that you don't even think about, and then having a conversation around that. That goes to the essence of a new kind of knowledge sharing. A new kind of knowledge sharing capturing much of the tacit, but then reflecting on it collaboratively to see what it actually does mean. But let's go further. The big shift calls for more than just scalable learning and unlearning. Um, I'm going to claim, and this is a bit kind of bizarre, I'm going to claim that it really causes for a new fancy word, ontology. Um, by ontology, I actually mean a kind of original meaning, a new way of being. Let's think about this a moment. I'm going to claim we're going to kind of cultivate a kind of a blended ontology, a way of being, that honors homo sapien, man is knower, but couples it in to homo faber, man is maker. And in fact, it's not at all hard to believe that in the world of constant change, as we're participating in knowledge flows, we're trying things out. Those things we're trying out, we're learning. That folds into the homo sapien. We get stuck. We pull new stuff down to look at it. And so there's a very interesting conversation between these two sides of my brain, homo sapien and homo faber, man is knower. And in fact, if you think about it a moment, what's the very essence of John Dewey? What's the very essence of pragmatism? How do you learn in conversation with matter, with doing things? This whole sense of we've kind of separated these two worlds. The real catch is how do we bring them together 
in a brand new way. But I want to, don't want to stop just there. I want to consider something we never talk about in the corporate world and most other parts of the world as well. Um, I'm going to call it homo ludens, a term created by Cusini, um, an amazing anthropologist and, and um, sociologist. Homo ludens is man who plays. I want to suggest in this world of constant change, perhaps we've underestimated the importance of man or humankind as player. Um, and then look at how these three things get blended together. Let me expand homo ludens a brief moment because I can guarantee most of us here have never thought about this particular thing, at least as an academic exercise. Homo ludens is definitely a highly nuanced <coughs> sense of play. Yes, as in play, of course you have a permission to fail, fail, and fail again. I'm getting sick and tired of hearing that in Silicon Valley, so I'd like to scratch that off, but it's still there. Uh, but more interesting to me is there's a play of imagination. Think about how do you do rap music or how do you actually do poetry. You're constantly taking a phrase and playing with it in your mind. You're turning it over and over again, twisting it here, twisting it there, seeing how it fits in on that line, so on and so forth. There's a certain sense of playing with the material. Also think about it as what constructs an epiphany. An epiphany is a set of things you've been asked to explain that don't make any sense. You have to play with it, and all of a sudden, bang, it locks into place. In fact, some of us have a mantra in the field of learning and education that if I can create an epiphany for a student, that epiphany stays with that student for life. There's a certain sense of the struggle, the play. And once it snaps, you got it. Um, I could take you through all kinds of, um, uh, of um, e you know, epiphanies, I mean, th uh, through kind of riddles, because the easiest way to see this play out is think about a riddle, how confusing it is initially, and then how it snaps. I claim that we're facing riddle after riddle after riddle in this exponential world. How do you play with that? If you don't feel comfortable playing with that, these riddles just piss you off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least they do me. Uh, uh, so there's a certain sense of learning how to play. Um, but what it really means, in the spirit of play, it's how do you probe? How do you push the boundaries? How do you challenge the rules in a safe way? How do you engage in deep tinkering? Because Basically, if we even take a new iPhone that just come out, um, you know, if you have to go to the manual to learn how to use it, you get angry, at least I do. Uh, instead, what do I expect? I expect to tinker with it, I play with it, I figure out kind of the boundaries of that. I know it's gonna be moderately safe, sometimes I'm screwed, but, uh, uh, but there's a certain sense of, you know, it, in this world of constant change, if I feel comfortable to play, to push, it's almost like you know, you're getting a car, and what's the play in the wheels, steering wheel? You listen to that play in order to figure out how to drive a new car, especially if you're doing a high performance car. Um, so there's a certain sense that that ability to take play seriously, maybe it's the very essence of picking up and being comfortable with this kind of accelerating change. Um, and finally, this notion of play has a great deal to do with how do you interrogate context. To go back to the whitewater uh, kayaking, a whitewater kayaker knows how to read context unbelievably well. It can read context in order to understand what's beneath the water surface. You see the surface, but how do you read the deep structure below the surface? By the way, in terms of how do you hack cyber systems, it's exactly how do you read below the surface, as you know. <laughs> um, so I just think that, that these are kind of the skills that really kind of are at, 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 at risk here, uh, at stake here. In fact, if you go back to even thinking about fake news, what we really have is a kind of illiteracy where we don't know how to interrogate context ourselves very well. How do we act like a detective? I was going to actually play Sherlock Holmes, but uh, out of time to do that, um, to show you how a skilled person could interrogate context 
to fill in the gaps of what was there and make shrewd imaginative judgments of what to do. Um, so this whole sense of playing with the context, interrogating context, by the way, is probably the answer to fake news. Um, but these are the types of the issues that I think we're all facing even without the issue of fake news. But I want to suggest that what we really have now is kind of a use of imagination to bring all three of these things together simultaneously in terms of new knowledge, interacting, having a conversation, and also pushing boundaries. And how that, fused by imagination, actually gives us a whole new way to operate in this exponential world. But I want to kind of start ending here with a different kind of a question. Um, it's a question that's in the sense of learning new ways to do things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is there a new kind of symbiotic relationship between us and computation? As many of us keep hearing these scare stories about the power of artificial intelligence eliminating all our jobs and so on and so forth. Um, by the way, eliminating job is not the same thing as eliminating work, but the, so we won't go down that path at the moment. Um, but I want to kind of rethink this symbiotic relationship a moment. And let's go back in history, um, 1996 versus 1997. Um, in 1996, Gary, the grand master of chess, kind of wipes the best chess machines we'd ever built. In 1997, Deep Blue comes along from IBM and turns around and wipes him off the map. This was a scary moment. Very scary. Or was it? Here's what never is talked about. Uh, and this is much more modern. We have something new. We have something now, I call it, uh, they call it, pardon me, the free chess, um, uh, freestyle chess tournament. And here's the deal. It's now possible in the, the world competitions on this where I have to play chess by the rules, but I can use whatever augmentations I want. Um, here's a particularly interesting augmentation. Two kids got together. Well, slightly older than kids, but to me kids. Uh, um, one was a moderately good chess player, but moderately good, by the way, 1,600. And I don't know how many of you play chess, but that's not that good. <laughs> um, and the other was a geek, um, and he pulled his Apple computer, um, hardly deep blue, um, and put a whole bunch of kind of really smart ways to use that to check out things. But what happened is these two kids, these two folks, learned how to work together powerfully. The whole was much more than the sum of the parts. And in fact, the geek was constantly checking the free imagination of Zach uh, and back and forth. So there was a generative dance happening in some sense between machine and man and man. Um, here's the story. This generative dance, this ability to do this generative dance, completely wipes off the map the world's best chess players and the world's best chess machines. Game over. This combination wins in almost all the time, assuming that these two folks have learned how to work together. One using machine for what the machine is best at, and the other using his imagination for what is best at. So I'm suggesting there's a new kind of knowledge sharing and knowledge creation going on. Is what is this new form of the generative dance that is happening between us and our machines, which is quite a different story than you tend to hear today. Um, so let me suggest that, in fact, I prefer to think about IA, not AI, as Tom Friedman is famous for saying, um, IA being intelligent augmentation, intelligent assistance. And I just want to go back here and ask, 
do we actually have a new kind of blended ontology where Homo sapien is increased by IA, Homo faber is increased by IA, and Homo ludens is increased by IA. We all do it ourselves here, just in terms of Homo, uh, homo sapien. I don't know about you, but I'm constantly in a conversation pulling up my cell phone to go to Wikipedia to look something up, big deal. Well, Wikipedia is smart, okay? That's an interesting form of IA. Um, or if you're in the medical field, you might call on Watson, IBM's famous Watson, um, to kind of fill you in on something, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's an interesting sense of how does even my cell phone advance my ability to have a really powerful conversation with you? Um, we do it, most of us unconsciously in a way, but it's a very interesting example of a new type of generative dance between the world of facts, knowledge, and Wikipedia, et cetera, and um, our own knowledge. Um, Homo Faber, the same kind of thing. Most of us think about 3D printing, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm particularly interested in how these devices become intelligent assistants for guidance, for coaching, for debugging, for critiquing. Um, so how can I go out, and my particular interest right now is synthetic biology, brand new domain, how I can start to engage in almost a, a maker movement, getting coached by people that are really experts in this or machines that are really good at this kind of thing. So there's a new kind of generative dance there, and those two generative dances go together. And of course, I just mentioned the Homo Ludens with uh, IA is exactly the example of freestyle chess. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so I want to suggest we can wrap that all together with our imagination, and we really become quite different in terms of how do we handle knowledge capture, knowledge sharing um, in this new world where change is omnipresent, the exceptions are the only things that to expect, um, and how do we play with those rather than run from them. Um, and let me just say, um, of course, if these are IA systems, this actually enables us to form groups together. How do we start to create a kind of networked imagination in action with this kind of stuff, um, which in some sense was the secret sauce of Silicon Valley in the early days? How now do we do that across our multiple tribes uh, today around the world? This really does suggest that there's a new type of indwelling, a term very much trafficking in the tacit, across these distributed now communities of practice, um, creating something I'm going to call the networked imagination. Um, so let me just close with saying that, you know, I think what we're really walking into is there is something unique about our imagination. It's the ability to integrate opposing qualities, like emotion and reason, curiosity, and certainty. How do they play off of each other? Um, I want to read one final quote um, from my colleague, uh, Ann Pendleton Julian. For adults, play is a space of permission to unlearn rules in order to experiment with possibilities that reimagine the world under different terms, concretely and socially, with different rules or with themselves in different roles. Imagining ourselves in different roles Playing with those roles allows us to discover new capabilities, new interests, imagine alternative pathways forward, and build new social relationships. Design unbound, designing for emergence in a whitewater world. Um, um, by the way, this is the kind of thing we're doing a lot of work in Singapore with Peter Ho on. Um, so let me end with just a word of caution that I think we all here experience one way or another. But I'm willing to pass these slides out, so don't worry about taking notes, et cetera. <laughs> nice to say that now, but sorry. <laughs> I'm not too good at looking ahead of my own stuff. <laughs> um, the real difficulty in changing any enterprise lies not in developing new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. One more knowledge sharing challenge as if our job isn't hard enough before the big shift. Yes, folk, yes, we do have that challenge. Thank you.